Um, this is an excerpt from the main women's report, so it shows you uh, the index for Wales. Uh, it's largely similar picture to previous indices of deprivation, um, and as you might expect, if you're familiar with Wales, um, there are pockets of deprivation in the South Wales valleys and the large cities, and also across the North Wales coast as well. On slide seven, um, I'm looking at what, what was the motivation for producing an index? Why do we create an index? Well, tackling poverty is a key objective of the Welsh Government, um, and there are a number of policies that support this aim. So we have, um, for example, a Community First uh, Programme, which is a community-focused tackling poverty programme. Um, it provides funding for delivery bodies within local authority areas to narrow the economic, education, and health gaps between the most deprived and the more affluent areas. Another example is Flying Start, which is part of our early years program for families with children under four living in disadvantaged areas of Wales, which I think is similar to the Sure Start um, program in England. The Welsh Government has um, a Tackling Poverty Action Plan and a Child Poverty Strategy and tackling poverty is very much a cross-cutting agenda, um, with many areas of policy across the Welsh Government feeding into that key aim. Um, things like the prevention of homelessness, affordable homes, regeneration, etc. How is women used? Well, on slide 8, you'll see um, some of the main uses of recent indices of deprivation. So within the Welsh Government, it's used for the development and monitoring of the Communities First programme. It's used in the calculation of school families, um, and some of the underlying data was used in identifying areas in which to put the Flying Start services. Local governments also uh, use WIMD. Um, there are some examples on the slide there, local area profiles, needs assessments. And it's also widely used by a range of other organisations, so academia, third sector, health organisations, police and fire services, etc. On slide nine um, is a diagram showing the, um, the governance for the index. So at the bottom, we've got seven domain groups. So the domain groups were responsible for making technical recommendations on the indicators to be included in the index. And the domain groups included Welsh Government analysts, um, academics, and other analysts as relevant. So on education, for example, we had an analyst from a local authority um, and a statistician from Eston, the schools inspectorate, as well as an academic from Cardiff University. We then established a new dissemination group and the main focus was on dissemination and communication, and that was where we discussed publication products, the importance of guidance materials, etc. We also had an advisory group, which uh, was, uh, its purpose was to advise the steering group, and that was made up of mostly external users. And then we had the steering group, which was the main decision-making body, and that was internal to the Welsh Government. On slide 10, um, we've got the timetable, so the, the three-year program of work that led up to the publication of, of WIMD. Um, at the start, we had a conceptual review, so we had uh, three academics review the concept of deprivation and to look at whether the index, whether we were measuring the right things. Then we uh, set up the domain groups, um, and the domain groups were tasked with reviewing the existing indicators and to consider new ones, new data sources that might have become available, uh, and to put forward proposals for, uh, for consultation. We then held a public consultation on the domains and indicators at the end of 2013, start of 2014. And then uh, we, took, we undertook further work as a result of the responses to that uh, consultation, and we looked into some indicators that were suggested by uh, respondents, things like off-gas, broadband, etc. Then phase four was the collection of data and the construction of the index, and then we published towards the end of 2014. What were the, were the products? Well, 
before we publish the main WIMD project, um, I should say that throughout the development of WIMD, we had close collaboration with policy colleagues and with users. Um, and the needs of the users were um, key to decisions about the methodology and the communication of the results. And one of the key messages that we regularly received from talking to internal and external users and from discussions at the dissemination group was the importance of effective communication and strong guidance. There's scope for, um, there was scope for the index to be misunderstood and to be misused, and people were regularly giving us examples of how the index had been misused in the past. So a key focus for us was publishing effective guidance documentation. So two weeks prior to launching WIMD, we published an infographic explaining how WIMD was calculated. Um, and we also published guidance documents uh, and frequently asked questions. So we looked at what does a WIMD measure? We looked at some of the do, do's and don'ts. So yes, you can compare deprivation for small areas, but no, you can't compare ranks over time, for example. And we also looked at some of the limitations of WIMD and tried to stress these as well. WIMD is not the only measure of deprivation. It's produced for a specific purpose, which was to identify multiple deprivation at the small area level. Um, another limitation is that it doesn't identify individuals that are multiply deprived, but it identifies areas where there are concentrations of different types of deprivation. Um, we tried to publicize these guidance projects, and it, we felt that it was an opportunity for users to digest the guidance before the main publication. Um, I think otherwise there's a risk that the guidance documentation gets lost in the middle of all the other things that are published on the main publication day, and we received positive feedback from users about doing this. Slide 13 uh, lists the main WIMD product that we published. So there was a, a main publication, an executive summary. We published the data set on our Stats Wales website. Um, but we also published a summary as an Excel table. So the, the ranks for each of the areas as an Excel table uh, suitable for the less technical user. Um, in direct response to user feedback uh, during the consultation process, we published a statistic article on deprivation in rural areas, where we explored what is meant by rural deprivation. Different people mean different things when they refer to rural deprivation. Um, and within that stats article, we also provided guidance on how WIMD and its indicators can and can't be used to analyze deprivation in rural areas. We also launched a new interactive tool, which I'm going to show you um, in a minute. Um, and then after publication, we also published the technical information as well. And we worked hard on communication, uh, emails, tweets, etc. And we held a, a media briefing and did internal presentations for staff and various user groups. Uh, and also presented at a major conference in spring 2015 on tackling poverty. Uh, on slide 14, um, there's a screenshot of our Stats Wales website, and this is where the actual data on WIMD is published. Uh, here you can download the overall and domain ranks for WIMD, um, and you can also access the raw indicator data that feeds into the index. And again, slide 15 shows you an example of a data queue. Slide um, 17, I think, uh, shows the home screen of um, our new bilingual interactive product. Um, at, at that home page, you'll find some background information on WIMD. And if you look at slide 18, you'll also see that you can access some of the summary maps uh, for the index. So you can look at the overall index map. And you can also look at the deprivation map for each of the domains. So here we've got the access to services domain which looks very different to the overall index uh, map, and you'll see that the most deprived LSOAs in terms of access to services tend to be in the more rural areas. Um, so on slide 19, uh, on slide 19, uh, we're back to the home page of the interactive project, and we, uh, you can search 
my postcode. So you can type a postcode into the box at the top. Uh, and as an example, I'm going to show you the results of a postcode that's close to our Welsh Government Office building in Cardiff. Uh, when you type in your postcode, you're then shown uh, a map um, with a marker in the postcode so that you can see where the LSA, which LSOA that postcode lies within. And in this example, we're in uh, an LSOA called Platina with size, which you can see at the bottom right. And that LSOA is shown in red on the map. In the bottom right-hand corner, we can see that this LSOA is the 168th most deprived in Wales, which places it in the top 10% most deprived LSOAs. And you might be able to see that there's an arrow that points downwards towards the darker blue box, which represents the most deprived 10%. You can also click across the domain boxes at the top of the page, and you'd be able to look at the individual domain ranks for Platina with size 2. Um, I'm now, now going to show you what happens if you click on the view the full deprivation profile box at the bottom right, if you're able to read it. So this page gives us a fuller profile for our LSOA. It gives us information on uh, in which local authority it lies, which health board, community first area, constituency area, etc. And you can also click on these to find results for those particular areas. And on this page as well, we also have a barcode display. So in this example, um, each black line represents one LSOA within a given geography. So in this example, it's Cardiff Local Authority. The left hand side represents the most deprived and the right the least. Deprived. And immediately underneath the barcode, you should be able to see 10 equal sized blue boxes representing the death, the death dial. And underneath, there are the other groups that we regularly use, which are the most deprived 10% through to the least deprived 50%. So in this example, our LSOA is shown in red on the barcode on the left hand side. And you'll also note that many of the LSOAs in Cardiff are in the most deprived 10% of LSOAs in Wales, and many are also in the least deprived 10% on the right-hand side. And this distribution looks different to what the distribution would look like for some of the more rural, rural authorities, where they tend to be more bunched in the middle. If we look at slide 22, um, here we can see more barcodes for Cardiff and for our particular LSOA. So in addition to the overall index barcode at the top, um, we can also see the income and employment domain barcodes, which are similar to the overall, which is what you might expect. And then if we move on to slide 23, you can see the barcodes for some of the other domains. So if you look at access to services, which is the third one down, for example, you'll see that our LSOA is within the least. 10% of LSOAs in Wales. And you'll also see that the other LSOAs in Cardiff also tend towards the least deprived end too. So these pages have shown us how we can consider the data for one particular LSOA. Um, and this is useful for the casual user who only wants results for one LSOA or a handful of LSOAs. So they're able to access summary results for that LSOA. They don't need to know what LSOA they're interested in, they can just search by postcode or by area, and they don't need to use that Wales website either, which can be uh, perhaps a little bit daunting for the less technical user. Moving on to slide 24, we can also look at the de deprivation maps for particular geographies. So in this example, we've overlaid the local health board boundaries on top of the LSOA deprivation map. And we can select one health board area to examine in more detail. So I'm going to select the Cardiff and Vale University Health Board. Um, on slide 25, provides a summary information on deprivation within this particular geographical area. So it tells you how many LSOAs are in this area, how many are in the most deprived 10% in Wales. And you can change the flexibility to change some of those parameters. If you were to scroll down on this page on the interactive site, 
you'd also be given then a list of the LSOAs in question, so you can easily find, for example, the names or the codes of the LSOAs within your geography that are within the most deprived 10% in Wales, for example. Um, from talking to users, a lot of users are interested in the index for their particular area, be that a local authority or a community first area or a health board. So this tool allows that type of user to easily look at results for their area and it gives them a ready-made profile of results for that area. Again, something that might be time-consuming for them to do themselves from SATS Wales. And it also hopefully duplicate, um, avoids the duplication of work as well. Um, turning back to look at the user response and media coverage on slide 27, we received positive feedback from a range of users on the guidance documentation and also this tool. As I mentioned earlier, on the morning of the publication, we held a technical media briefing for a small number of journalists. Um, we were conscious that the publication of a new index would always attract media coverage, um, and our aim was to make sure that the index was properly understood. And we felt that it was worthwhile as it did lead to balanced and informed media briefing. And it was nice to see that um, the infographic and some of our other publication material was actually used within some of the written press stories. And the BBC Wales TV and radio reporting, for example, did make a point of emphasizing the limitations of WIMD and did use some of the phrases that we regularly use in our output. Uh, again, on slide 28, we've got some further responses. So we had a lot of web hits on the day of publication. Um, some independent websites built their own apps using uh, our data on the first day of publication. Um, and we also had feedback that anti-poverty champions in local authorities welcomed the range of outputs, including in particular the guidance on, on rural areas as well. And we've had ad hoc feedback from charities, schools, community first areas, uh, et cetera, saying that they found the tool useful as well. Um, what have we done since we've published the index? Well, slide 30 uh, lists or gives you information on some recent publications. So at the end of last year, we published a statistical article uh, called Area Analysis of Child Deprivation 2014 which analyzed the indicator data for children for the six indicators listed on that slide. Um, and as well as that article, we also published a guide to analyzing indicator data. Um, that included a guide to what indicator had already been published on Stats Wales, how to access it, some of the do's and don'ts for analysis, and also links to existing analysis. And in October 2015, we also published a stats bulletin um, analysis of the access to services domain in WIMD by type of settlement, which looked at the travel times used in the construction of ranks, as well as the ranks themselves. Uh, so slide 31 looks at um, our future plans. We don't have a firm date yet for the next index. It might take longer than the usual three-year gap due to data developments we are hoping that might happen first. In the meantime, we will uh, continue our annual indicator update. So the underlying indicator data that's used within WIMD is published on an annual basis. One of the key messages to users is that the WIMD ranks provide information on relative multiple deprivation, but that users need to look at the underlying data analyze change in deprivation levels over time. So we'll continue to publish the underlying indicator data of various geographies. Um, we're also looking to continually improve and expand the indicator data, for example, by adding um, age breakdown to some of the indicators and adding some more geographies. And we're also considering other statistical articles following on from the child article. We're also conscious that work on potential improvements to the next index need to start sooner rather than later. And some of the areas that have been identified as priority areas are housing, 
we acknowledge that the housing domain at the moment is, is poor. Uh, crime, uh, the process for receiving and processing the crime data is very resource intensive. And also income and employment, we need to consider the impact of universal, the rollout of universal credit. Uh, perhaps it's also worth mentioning as well that there's a Four Nations Index of Deprivation Working Group, which is also a useful forum for working together and considering developmental areas and, and common areas of uh, difficulty as well. And then to finish on slide 32, just looking back briefly what were some of the lessons learned, um, the importance of working with key users throughout the, the, the um, program of work, to get feedback on what is required, um, the importance of planning communication and development, and the importance of letting users know exactly what will be published and when, um, to provide very clear advice on use, guidance information, that sort of thing, and technical briefing for the press. Um, presentations and dissemination is important to engage users and have policy impact and also to learn from others and, and make best use of people's skills. Um, could I ask, um, could I, ask I, I was interested in your comments about working with the other countries and things towards <coughs> the end, and I just wondered, uh, had, had there been any um, looking at the, the differences between the, the different um, indices of multiple deprivation that have been used in the different countries, and, and if so, um, what, what they were or what we knew about them? Yeah, a common question is, is what should a user do if they want to use an index across the UK? Mm. And the answer is that the indices are different. They're not comparable, mm. but they're different for particular reasons. Some of those are because of data availability, and some of them are also because of different perhaps policy drivers in each of the countries. Mm. So for example, the, the justice system is different in Scotland. In England and Wales, the education systems are different. Um, so Yes, I think the differences between the indices are acknowledged, but that group also recognises that there are lots of common things between the indices and that there is scope for the countries to work together on some of those in, um, on some of the underlying indicators and, and possibly try and align some of the underlying indicators where possible so that the underlying data can be used to compare across countries. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. I mean, having worked with, it, with indicators and things, one of, one of the frustrating things can be where there's a, a gap and no data. So to what extent has, has the team that developed this been able to encourage um, additional data collection in, in, in the sort of areas that you feel are perhaps weak, or maybe you will be doing that, in areas you consider weak within the index, rather than um, being confined to data that's already collected. Uh, you're right. We are, we are confined to some extent by the data that's already um, collected. One example would be on the housing domain. We acknowledge ourselves that the housing domain is poor, and that's because of a lack of available data. We haven't had a housing survey in Wales since 2008. But uh, the requirement for WIMD is something that's very much feeding into um, a program of work that's been taken forward at the moment, housing conditions evidence. We've got some people looking into um, the possibility of undertaking a housing survey in the next few years, and women is very much one of the, uh, the key priorities that, that's sort of driving that program of work. So we very much hope that that will be taken forward and that we will be able to use that survey in some way, perhaps to model some administrative data, for example, so that we've got some something for the next few Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Mike Hardy from the Office of National Statistics. Um, Mike's currently Assistant Deputy Director of Surveys and Economic Indicators at ONS and is responsible for a range of business surveys, including foreign direct investment and international trade in services, the annual business survey and the purchases survey. And his recent work has been on published microdata analysis to understand the role of foreign direct investment in the recent current account deterioration and the report on the feasibility of measuring the sharing economy. Um, today Mike is going to talk on, on, the, topic, on the topic which um, led to uh, ONS being runners-up in the Official Statistics Awards, uh, 
which was their digital day, um, for which he's uh, recently assumed responsibility, I think. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Mike. Thank you, Andy, and thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, digital day took place in August 2014, um, and unfortunately, I wasn't actually directly involved in the event. Um, my predecessor, who was responsible for the internet access release, um, which today is centered around oversaw the day. Um, so I feel like a little bit of a fraud giving this presentation today. Um, however, I was responsible for a different area of the division, um, and this event was held up as an exemplar for how we should communicate with a range of different users at ONS. Um, and I've used the feedback from the event um, to inform a range of analysis that I've undertaken over the last 18 months. So even though I wasn't directly involved, hopefully I'm well placed um, to give a comprehensive overview of the day um, and do the high quality innovative work that was undertaken justice. So moving on to the second slide, I have an overview of what I'm going to cover. Um, I'm firstly going to start with what, what is digital day and what do we do during the day. Um, and then I'm going to touch on the feedback and our engagement with the users. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what did we learn from the event. And it's been 18 months since the event was undertaken. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've used the feedback and what we did next. Moving on to slide three, what was digital day? Um, before I give uh, an overview of the day, I'd just like to briefly introduce the statistics. Um, so the event was centered around the Internet Axel Access Household and Individual Statistical Bulletin. Um, so these statistics measure um, the portion of adults that access the internet during a given year. And it cuts the data in a range of different ways. So for example, how they access the internet, if they access it via computer, tablet, or smartphone. And it also looks at the nature of their purchases as well. Throughout the presentation, I'll also be talking about e-commerce statistics. Um, and e-commerce statistics are the sale or purchase of a good or service conducted um, over computer networks. Um, and this can be divided into two aspects. Um, the first is website sales, um, which I assume we're all familiar with. Um, and the second is electronic data interchange. Um, the best way to describe the latter um, is if you're a supermarket and you're interacting with your wholesaler and you have a digital framework set up and an aspect of your stock um, is sold and then um, the digital platform would send an automatic request to your wholesaler to order more of the stock and they would deliver it. This is how businesses interact. So if we take the internet access release and also e-commerce statistics, um, these are coupled together um, to talk about digital statistics um, as a whole. Um, so why do we do digital day? Um, there had been an EU task force led by Lord Young um, and it said that we need to um, discover robust and comprehensive statistics around the digital economy. Due to the change in nature of the UK economy as well and technical innovation, e-commerce statistics um, are becoming more vital. So for example, 20% of turnover in the UK um, is undertaken through e-commerce um, and 81% of adults in the have purchased um, via the internet over the last year, and that's much higher than the EU average. So the EU average is 53%. Um, so the digital agenda is extremely important for the UK economy. That coupled with the fact that one of ONS's key objectives is to improve the communication of our statistics um, led to a perfect storm in terms of digital day. And the idea behind the day was twofold. The first was to produce a range of analysis cater for all our users. And the second was to interact with our users in real time, so to communicate with them via Facebook and Twitter. So moving on to slide four. I spoke a little bit about in the previous slide about producing analysis to cater for all our users. So in order to do that, you need to firstly define um, our users, which can be quite challenging, but ONS has undertaken a range of work to identify its users, uh, and it's come up with the following three types of users. So the first um, is our expert analysts, and ONS has traditionally liaised with these really well. Um, these are users that often come to the ONS website, they know exactly what they want, they know the specific data that they need to download, they download in, into an Excel file and undertake a variety of analysis 
using that data. So a good example of this type of user would be the Bank of England. They wouldn't necessarily be interested in the commentary that we produce. They just want good, reliable stats to undertake um, their analysis. The second type of user um, is an information forager. Um, so this is the type of user that wants high-level summaries and narratives and charts. Um, so good examples of these type of users um, would be the media, who want to come onto the ONS website, access the data really quickly um, to write the story, or possibly people that own small businesses that want to use ONS data to inform business decisions. The third type of user that was identified um, was the inquiring citizen. So these are people that would like to access official statistics to inform um, the public debate. So a good example would be the EU referendum. Somebody wants to learn more about the referendum and wants to access official statistics to inform their decision on how they would um, vote. Um, so they want impartial information. These users do not necessarily go to the ONS website directly. They may access it through a link on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and they want kind of clear, concise communication of the statistics. Um, and this may be done through just summary charts um, and infographics. Um, so traditionally, the, US, the ONS has been extremely good at communicating with its expert users. We have a number of user groups set up quarterly, sometimes monthly, to discuss with a range of government departments and some of the city analysts as well for the recent economic forum that we've organized. Um, however, traditionally, we haven't been as successful um, in engaging with information foreigners and inquiring citizens. Um, the idea behind this day was to produce um, a range of analysis that would cater um, for all these user personas. I should say that the analysis that I'll present on the next slide, um, which is the type of analysis, um, aren't exclusive to each type of persona, so there may be some overlap. So moving on to the fifth slide. Um, we published four releases. Um, our traditional bulletin for internet access, households, and individuals. Um, we also published a short story and then an explanatory paper um, proposing a range of indicators to monitor e-commerce um, and a more technical paper on e-commerce and the wider national accounts. So on slide six, um, I've outlined the statistical bulletin. So this is the way ONS has traditionally communicated its statistics. Um, it caters for all of the users. However, it may not fulfill all their needs. So the traditional statistical bulletin has um, a number of key points, um, which may be used by the inquiring citizen, and then maybe um, the in-depth analysis that's done throughout the bulletin will be used by the information forager and the data tables where you have the detailed breakdown of all the different cuts of the data um, would be used by the expert um, analyst. Um, however, as I said, it may not cater for all the needs of our, of our users. So on slide seven, um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the digital economy short story. So this was um, a short story that we published on the day of the release, and it was the glue for all the releases that went out on the day. Um, so it had a high-level overview of the main statistics um, on the digital economy, um, which catered for the inquiring citizen. However, it had links to all of the other products that we published on the same day. Um, so the internet access release that I mentioned, the monitoring e-commerce, the explanatory paper that give a set of indicators, and also the more detailed analysis um, on e-commerce and how it's measured across the national accounts. Um, we favored this model at ONS recently um, for publishing analysis. And the reason we favored this is because that we can react to quite topical um, things that are in the media. So we've used this format, for example, to publish data on the EU referendum and also the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and the idea is that we can use data from a range of different sources across ONS and pull it into a clear narrative and tell a story whereas the traditional statistical bulletins at ONS are quite rigid, so they focus only on one aspect of the statistics. So moving on to slide eight, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the monitoring e-commerce, the indicators. Um, so ONS decided to define 
the range of statistics into an indicator set um, into different categories and then produce them all into a dashboard, which I'll cover later, which is a, a digestible, just one page that highlights the key statistics, um, and then an interactive tool as well. So the indicator set um, divided the statistics into three areas. So key performance indicators, so the headline figures on e-commerce, so the monetary value of sales and the proportion of turnover. Um, the second, and a business engagement, um, so statistics broken down by size of business, industry, access to websites, broadband, um, and third, um, engagement by households and individuals, um, and activity associated with e-commerce. So now I'm on slide 10. So this is the dashboard that was produced um, and published on the ONS website, um, and it brings together all the statistics in quite a digestible format. So whereas the statistical bulletin that I previously highlighted may cover four or five key points at the start, this covers a much larger number of statistics and puts them in a, in a digestible format. So users that may not want to analyze the data in detail can go to this page and they can pick out um, key facts about the release and use them um, and spend very little time on the website to get up the data. On slide 11, this was developed further, um, and this was our interactive indicator. Um, so using the categories that I spoke about earlier, um, the key performance indicators, um, people could go to the website, and in the live mode, this allowed them to cut the data in different ways. So if I explain how this works, so if you take the business engagement, you can click on the different drop-downs, and it will give you different cuts of the data below. Um, and then also you can look at the time series. So underneath each chart, you'd have a year, and you could click on each year, and the data would change according to the year that you went into. So you could highlight the figure in the time series in 2008, and then play the series forward, and the chart will change in front of you. So if you're interested in a specific aspect of the data, so looking at sales by size of industry, um, you could click on a specific type of industry or size, and then you could see how that evolves over time. So the other um, product that I mentioned that we published on the same day um, was a technical paper. Um, so this was aimed at our expert analysts. So the technical paper looked at how we measure e-commerce and how it features in the national accounts, so how it's measured in the output expenditure and income measures of GDP, um, how conceptually um, e-commerce should be measured and how it should be separate from GDP, and also how e-commerce is used in certain aspects of GDP um, to measure um, expenditure. So hopefully that ties together all the products and it can be linked back to the, the type of user personas that we were trying to, to target. Um, so I mentioned the second part of the day was to engage in real time um, with our users. Um, so we did that by setting up a, a Facebook group online and people had to register for the event in advance. Um, there were 71 people that actually registered for the, the event and there were 1,000 views over the day. Um, so on third, slide 13, on the right-hand side, you can see the staff that um, took part in the day. That was my predecessor, and then David, Hazel, and Cecil, a part of the e-commerce team that produced the statistics. Throughout the day, um, people that registered could ask the statisticians questions directly, and they could answer in real time. Um, also throughout the day, there were a number of tweets. Um, and I'll come on to these later, but the idea was that throughout the day, the event would be publicized through tweets. So we tweet infographics and then have a link to the Facebook page. So that would encourage traffic from um, the tweet onto the Facebook page and they could ask um, the team questions throughout the day. So the team sat there with our digital team on laptops and responded in real time to all the questions that were asked. Um, we also launched a consultation um, through the Facebook page, um, and the consultation received 33 responses, um, 
which was high um, for an ONS consultation through this kind of medium at the time. So here's some um, of the questions that were asked um, via the, the Q&A. Um, and one of the things that we found that were fed back from users is that they like to see the faces behind the statistics. So often when ONS produces statistics, they see the very foremost statistical bulletin and have a response from ONS. Um, if you look at each of the responses on slide 14, you can see that they were individual responses from the team um, and they could respond in real time. And there's quite a range of questions as well. Um, so specific about the data, asking them to, to give answers to specific questions on the data. Um, but they're also quite informal questions as well. So in the bottom left hand side, I mean, you have a question, which statistics shocked you the most? Um, this is quite challenging for ONS because as an organization, we have to be very careful as we're an independent organization and impartial. Um, but this was seen as pushing the boundaries of the time. Um, and we were able to um, answer quite informal questions um, and interact with users on a level that ONS probably hadn't interacted with users before. So moving on to slide 15, I spoke a little bit about the, the infographics. Um, so the next two slides are just a, a number of examples of the infographics that we published on the day. So these were targeted at kind of the inquiring citizen and information forager users. Um, and they encourage traffic um, onto um, the website um, and also onto the Facebook group as well. So we tweeted these um, throughout the day, every hour, and within the tweet, we also tweeted the image, but also a link to the Facebook group, and that encouraged traffic onto the um, Facebook group and further questions to the team. And slide 16 is just some more examples of the infographics that we tweeted throughout the day. So on slide 17, um, the summary of, kind of the Twitter activity on the day. Uh, and as you can see, Digital Day in London was the second highest trending hashtag on the day. Um, and usually we get the success when there's quite a slow news day. Um, but the Oscar Pretorius case was on at the time. That's just quite a busy news agenda, and we still managed to be the second highest um, trend in hashtag in London um, on the day of the event, um, although we did lose out to Arsenal Football Club Members Day. Um, but still, a good success for the office, and the map on the right-hand side shows that it was also trending across the UK as well, which at the time, when we tried to undertake this activity as an office, it was often low-key, and we'd really struggled um, to get um, a huge amount of activity on Twitter in particular. Um, so this was the first time the office had really um, kind of gathered momentum in this type of approach. So on slide 18, um, I've just covered some of the, the feedback and engagement with users on on Twitter. I'm just John Perkins on the on the left hand side, the top left. Um, just a quick tea to say thanks to Dave Hazel, Dave Hazel, Heather and Cecil for a great web chat. Um, and this kind of informal interaction worked really well. Um, so people were able to speak directly to the statisticians um, and also feedback via a, a variety of mediums such as Facebook um, and Twitter. Um, and there's a variety of other feedback as well on that slide. So what did we learn from the day? I think one of the main points that's coming out of the day is that there's a variety of different ways to communicate with our statistics, uh, our statistics and um, Traditionally, ONS has focused on its more technical users. Um, however, in order to communicate with a broad range of our users, there's no one size fits all. And I think at the time, being innovative and taking risks um, can really pay off um, and provide you know, a face to the numbers rather than the official communication that ONS has traditionally had um, with its users. And having a specific day as well to maximize coverage. Um, so we have a group at ONS now um, that's called editorial and communication group um, and it looks at a number of different ways that we can engage with the news agenda um, so if there's anything that we can engage with and use our stats to inform the debate so for example um, on the day of the, the budget um, we undertook live tweeting um, all day and we tweeted a range of ONS stats um, to add to the debate um, and we can do that in real time um, and we learned from the digital day um, event 
and this was the first time that we actually did this, um, and it's becoming more frequent um, at ONS. So what do we do next? There's a number of um, points here, um, but there's one in particular that I wanted to focus on, um, and that is that we have the, an e-commerce user event, um, which helps identify the facts um, in the meeting. So the feedback was used from the day um, to establish um, this event, um, which we held last October. Also covered in the slide, there were a range of other improvements that we made, such as um, including micro enterprises and um, incorporating some of the feedback that we received from the consultation. But I just wanted to talk specifically about the, the user event. Um, so as I said, we held a user event last October. Um, it was an ONS biz event. And it looks specifically at e-commerce and how it's changing the shape of business. Um, and as with Digital Day, in the run-up to the event, we produce a range of different types of analysis. So we use tweets, short stories, more technical papers to publicize the event. Um, so for five or six weeks in the run-up to the event, we publish these and link to the registration page for the e-commerce event. Um, and then on the day of the event, we also published a range of analysis um, to target the different user personas that um, I spoke about. The event was um, attended by over 100 users. We had quite high profile speakers like James Page, who's the chief economist at Spotify. Um, we also had James Roper from IMRG and Emma Jones, who represents a large number of small businesses um, across the UK. Um, and this event just reinforced that there's not one type of communication um, that can target all the um, users. So this event was really successful and fed off the feedback from Digital Day, which had been 18 months earlier. So here's some of the feedback from the event. Um, it was opened by John Pollincher and, as I said, a number of high-profile speakers. And we used the, as we did with Digital Day, we tweaked it throughout the day. So we tweeted, for example, when it opened, just a photo of John Pollinger, um, and then tweeted different types of analysis throughout the day. Um, and again, we could interact with our users in, in real time. Um, so again, the approach that we used for Digital Day was extremely successful for the e-commerce user event. So I mentioned that the feedback from Digital Day has been used um, across ONS and informed a range of different types of analysis. Um, so one of the initiatives we have at the moment is for our statisticians to have their own Twitter accounts and tweet about the, the data. Um, and this has been really successful over the past 18 months. Um, we now have over 20 tweeting statisticians. A lot of them have a large number of followers. Um, and it's just a really good way um, to communicate our statistics to users that we may not have necessarily interacted with through the traditional statistical bulletins and the project products that we um, produced. Um, so that, as I said, the feedback has been used extensively for the last 18 months. I suppose one of the interesting bits from my point of view, thinking about my in the GSM, is that the concept of tweeting by statisticians. And, and I just wondered um, how, how comfortable the statisticians felt about this. And, and um, you know, because it, it, it's quite, from the point of view of, um, of I think, of statisticians tend, tend in general to be quite risk averse, it's probably quite a, 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 would be seen by many people as quite a risky thing to do. And I just wondered how, how had you had feedback from them and how they felt about it? I think initially, statisticians. Um, not found it uncomfortable, but whenever we've produced statistics and published them at ONS, we've uh, got two or three rounds of quality assurance before um, disseminated outside of the building. Um, and obviously, we, we tweet um, there's an element of discretion in how you use the data. Um, but I think statisticians have used key messages from the bulletin, for example. Um, so then it's been sort of the, the element of QA. Um, but at the same time, you can use the information um, and get it out to a wide range of users very quickly. I'm so probably apprehensive at first, mm -hmm. um, but it's become the norm now. People are really comfortable with using Twitter, and most of our statisticians have a, a large number of followers as well. Yeah. Good. Anyone want to ask a question in the audience? Um, I suppose 
the other one for me um, is was thinking about, um, I mean, inevitably, as with many departments, there'll be pressure on um, pressure on finances, you know, and asset and the desire to um, to keep, you know, to cut down on, on various things. How do you think this approach will fare in, in the debate between, you know, when, when, when you have to reduce your expenditure, do you think this is, is likely to be more successful than, um, than concentrating on, for example, pushing raw data out for people to analyze themselves? How do you see that play? I think it's always challenging for government departments at the moment to develop their outputs given the, the pressure on finances. However, following the BEAM review, which we recently had at ONF, um, we, move, we want to move towards more being a service provider, where instead of just pushing the data out the door, that we have a company in our office that better explains our statistics and the users can use. Um, so I think that there will be pressures, but there is a big focus at the moment in ONS, and we've invested a huge amount in our digital website and ensuring that we have the capability to undertake this type of analysis. Um, so challenging, but it's going to be more of a focus for us moving forward. I'd, I'd like to thank um, Lynette and, and Mike um, for, for their presentations. Um, the, the RSS and, and uh, UKSA awards have been um, one of the ways that both those organisations have, have tried to stimulate innovative activities, and I think uh, both your presentations have well illustrated the sorts of innovations that are going on in, across the GSS at the moment, uh, and, and I've certainly found them very interesting. So I'm very grateful uh, to you both for your time in presenting uh, and to the audience for, for, for listening in.